Welcome to a new episode of the MBSE podcast. Today we will have a meeting on the west coast of the United States, so to say. So good morning to our guest, Chris Delp, who is a group supervisor at NASA JPL, so that Jet Propulsion Laboratory, if you don't know it, and one of the masterminds behind OpenMBE. We know Chris very well from various OMG meetings, but please, Chris, introduce yourself first. Yeah, I think I think you covered it. I work at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. I'm the group supervisor for the uh, Software Systems Solutions Engineering Group, and our group uh, produces the systems engineering environment led by Robert Carbon, who's a another MBSC celebrity. Um, and uh, for for the missions that we produce at JPL. And I was also part of the original team that came up with OpenMB at JPL. Yeah, great. So great to have you on the show, Chris. And well, probably not everyone knows OpenMB. So the first question is, what is OpenMB? What does it stand for? And well, how did it come about? So. OpenMBE stands for the Open Model-Based Engineering Environment. Uh, and the, the general premise of OpenMBE is that it's firstly a community in the open source world around model-based engineering practices, models, and software that support model-based engineering. So you have to know a little bit about what model-based engineering is. There's probably some debate around what that is I think in the open MB community, we're less about defining what that is um, and more about just, you know, enabling the practices and helping the whole concept evolve. So whatever your model is, uh, open MB wants to talk about it. The products that exist are, I'm sorry, as an open source project, we're supposed to call projects. So the projects that exist in open MB are principally the open SE cookbook, which was contributed by Robert Carbon. Um, the, model, the model management system, which is the core uh, server product around managing engineering models. Um, the view editor, which is a web application that allows uh, document-based interactivity around, uh, it's a, it's a, a model-based document application is maybe a better way to say it. Um, that allows you to integrate the descriptions of different models. Um, and then the MDK collection, which is the model development kit. So various tools uh, that perform different kinds of modeling. We have an architecture called the MDK. The most famous one is the Magic Draw, or I guess now Cameo uh, model development kit, which integrates Magic Draw to so smell uh, BPMN, et cetera, into the OpenMB. Uh, open source environment. So these products mm -hmm. exist. Uh, they don't, but they don't necessarily limit the definition of what OpenMB is. OpenMB is firstly a community, uh, like I said. So um, some some misunderstandings are, oh well, if I don't have anything that integrates with MMS View Editor, then I'm not part of OpenMB. Uh, that's that's definitely not the case. Anybody who has open source models, open source practices, anything they want to bring and contribute to OpenMB as that open source community, that's really the, the beachhead that we're trying to forward things along on. Mm -hmm. And Chris, can you give us a little bit more uh, historic information? So what, what was the motivation to do something like OpenMB? It's a huge thing in the sure. in, 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 in meantime. Sure, it has it. I think it has kind of an interesting origin story, um, and the or part of the origin story comes from ESO and Robert Carbon, who I've mentioned a few times. So he'd have to tell the ESO side, uh, but the JPL side uh, occurred when I was early in my career at JPL. Model-based systems engineering was very new, um, and I think the prevailing premise at the time was that documents are bad, and documents are going to go away and someday everybody will just be working with models. Um, in retrospect, probably a bit naive, uh, especially considering that probably lots of software developers had similar 
uh, hopes of that someday their code would just be self-documenting. But uh, yeah, so we started uh, on a project at JPL to modernize uh, mission operations with modeling. Um, and what we what we found initially is that kind of, and kind of organically was that while the while the models were great for solving engineering problems, we had a difficult time communicating them. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of people in systems engineering traditionally uh, build uh, documents, right? And so for folks who were interested in models, they couldn't reconcile the models they were making with the products that they were being asked to produce. Um, and so we started connecting the two up. How can we, you know, take these models and generate the products that people need? Uh, and that's where the first kernel of OpenMB on the JPL side was born called mm -hmm. DocGen. So DocGen built an executable modeling yeah. language to generate the actual, the, the document to query the model and, and basically linearize a particular story or viewpoint into how the, uh, how the, how the model is describing something. And that's when we discovered IEEE 1471 or as it's, I think, now referred to as ISO 42010, which is the standard for our systems architecture description. Mm -hmm. And that talks about view and viewpoints. Um, and that was a real game changer because the model could now be unified with the products that, that systems engineers needed to make. Uh, and they suddenly had a whole new avenue of controlling the quality of the technical content. Um, so the thought experiment I always give in this part is kind of like, you know, if you have uh, somebody who's got like a really great Simulink model and it, it can answer all kinds of questions about the system. Or may, maybe in today's speak, it'd be more of a CST model, an executable system model or a Medellica model or something. Um, and you've got your requirements and doors or whatever. Uh, and then you've got um, um, the presentations you have to give, right? And in these PowerPoint decks. So um, you've got all this rich technical content um, but how do you get it into something that people can consume in these reviews? So um, you can imagine having having the live connection to all that information would be a much richer experience. So that mm -hmm. that kind of became the goal. Um, we started generating the documents. Magic Draw is a desktop tool, so suddenly everybody's desktop was filling up with documents. We created a platform called DocWeb, which basically just automated the production of those documents and stored them on the web so that you could browse them. Uh, and users just loved it. And the first question they asked was, where's the edit button? And then uh, view editor and MMS were born out of that. So, um, okay. and it's, so it's, a lot of it is built around web-based concepts and bringing that information to the mm -hmm. web. Uh, and also for me personally, kind of reconciling that idea that no, not everybody's going to use models um, and that really there's still a communication practice in systems engineering that has to take place where we can linearize the story and communicate these views uh, mm -hmm. across disciplines uh, and pull pull people's uh, disparate models in, in together to that story earlier. Um, and that leads, of course, to the digital twin and perpetual, you know, continuous integration and all that stuff. So. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Uh, if I understood it correctly, you started with SysML, right? You, you mentioned magic draw models and so on, so you started with SysML models. Uh, mm -hmm. And which other kind of models are uh, can also be integrated in, in the MMS? So today's MMS uh, comes in, today's released MMS comes in a flavor where you can publish the JSON format of any model into the MMS. Mm -hmm. um, so what you get out of the box today uh, pretty much anything that can interact with web services like Python or Mathematica or something like that can produce and consume models in this way. Um, and of course, we have the Magic Draw integration. And mm -hmm. I believe I believe there is somebody who has contributed an early Pyrus integration, but I haven't seen it yet. Um, and there mm -hmm. there are, there are other con contributions coming that I can't talk about yet. Um, mm -hmm. But the 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 next version of MMS is MS5 is completely transformational. The a long, a long sought technology that we waited a 
a long time to mature was the graph database. Um, mm -hmm. I think we we all in this sphere have seen the significance of graphs in in how models are handled in technology. Um, but when we built the first version of the MMS, such things were fantasy only. <laughs> <laughs> even the even the fledgling things that existed out there, even the things you could buy were were difficult to scale. There were no standard interfaces. Um, mm -hmm. You know, things like Gremlin, Tinkerpop didn't exist. The semantic web community existed, but they didn't have the uh, technology horsepower to build horizontally scalable web services that could handle millions of millions of elements. You know, if you, if you look at the amount of model elements and it's something something from like Boeing, who's one of the OpenMB contributors, I mean, they have more model elements than I could ever even have dreamed. <laughs> <laughs> and we were stunned when they were able to put them all into MMS. We we're like, wow, we didn't, we had no idea that it could scale. <laughs> So, okay, yeah, that sounds just... uh, very, very interesting and promising. So um, maybe we should tell the people how they can try it by their own. So how how can I get OpenMBE? Is this a web service? Is it something I can download? It, it's both, actually. So and that's a that's a good question. So OpenMBE is open source, um, and it's available on OpenMBE.org. Um, mm -hmm. And for the MMS in particular, um, I think the cautionary tale that always comes here is it's, it is a web service. So, you, so in order to get it working, you will either have to know how to install and administrate uh, a Linux server, essentially. Um, and so sometimes that, that definitely catches people by surprise. They download it onto their laptop and then they can't figure out what to do. Um, so yeah, it's not a standalone desktop. Um, there is a hosted environment uh, provided by the SO that um, is used by the OMG and some other activities. Um, so you can at least test, te te test it out yourself and, and test taste it if you like um, and kind of see how it works. Um, so those are the two options. There are uh, the OpenSE cookbook, of course, you can download and load that into Magic Draw or read the documents of it. Um, and the Magic Draw, the Magic Draw plugin for OpenMB does allow you to do things with DocGen and, and stuff like that locally in your Magic Draw desktop session without connecting to MMS. Um, so yeah, that's that's kind of a high level. Uh, picture and of course you can also attend the open mb community meetings which happen uh every two weeks um mm -hmm. and the upcoming open mb workshop at incosi incosi iw this weekend mm -hmm. or monday technically mm -hmm. so what would you recommend uh, a real industrial project uh, if they would like to use open mbe so what or is it recommendable for for a real project to, to use it or uh, you, you need support uh, and, and things like that. Uh, so what what were the first steps or what would you recommend for them? I mean, that's, that's an interesting thread of discussion as well. Um, the use of open source software in various industrial scale organizations mm -hmm. runs the spectrum on earth today. Uh, some, some companies obviously like Google or, or, uh, Maybe SpaceX are are hawkishly forward looking in this space. More traditional defense industry folks are more reluctant. And of course, with open source in general, there's a, a range of misnomers. Um, I think the log for J issue recently helps people understand that just because you buy something from a vendor doesn't mean you're not using open source. <laughs> <laughs> it just means it just means you're paying for it. So Mm -hmm. um so for somebody starting out like that i mean i think firstly it's kind of a an, an introspective in the company like how does that company use open source what kind of resources do they have mm -hmm. um for for companies that have very old school it departments where they mostly host file servers and license servers and haven't gotten into web services yet it'll it'll be uh more of a i won't say necessarily more of a challenge but it'll be more effort 
So because mm -hmm. using using the MMS in particular means you're potentially pushing on the company's posture towards a shift towards web services from traditional uh, computing services. Um, and MMS4 is horizontally scalable. It runs if you run it on Docker. So um, it'll 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 it potentially could use a lot of computers. So um, and that so that's kind of where it starts. And then from there, you know, I mean, the main thing is is are you are you ready to put something like that together? Um, mm -hmm. And so how that's worked from an experiential standpoint. I mean, if you look at how Boeing deployed OpenMB. They have a really, really big enterprise IT system, and they were able to, you know, make those deployments work. They contribute back code. They're they're fully in, um, but they had to go through their own stuff. So that that would that probably that might not be a bad podcast someday to get them to talk about what they can talk about. Um, mm -hmm. Whereas if you look at, uh, I won't. If you look at like how how Ford has initially set it up, uh, I think they started as kind of with a kind of a small R and D effort just to kind of see what it did as part of how they were investigating MBSE in general. Um, mm -hmm. So, and then the the corporate side as well, because I mentioned vendors specifically. <laughs> uh, some vendors have adopted OpenMB technology into their product as well. Um, one of them, of course. The most famous one, of course, being No Magic. Now, just so um, yeah. they they pulled aspects of it into to their product. So, mm -hmm. and the, okay. the the main the main pieces mm -hmm. of OpenMB use uh, the Apache two license, which is commercial friendly. Um, so, vendors can some vendors have taken OpenMB technology and chosen not to disclose that they've done it, um, <laughs> and that's. <laughs> <laughs> They're fine to do so. Uh, the the soundbite I always give on this is, is, you know, JPL's participation in this was we we couldn't buy what we needed to do what we needed to do at the time, and so we built it. But mm -hmm. that didn't signal that we were ready to move into uh, building software products instead of space missions. Really, uh, we open sourced it as a way to communicate the requirements of what we need. Um, mm -hmm. And what happened is this, you know, along with how with ESO and, and then later Boeing, this turned into this, uh, you know, movement of, of different points of view around how open source can work with engineering environments and, and models and so forth. So mm. cool. So uh, let's assume I download the thing, install it, and um, I like it. Um, how can I get in touch with the OpenMB community? You already mentioned that there will be a workshop on the uh, international workshop from Ecosi next week. And uh, I guess there is a public Slack channel, isn't it? Correct. Yeah. If you go to openmb.org, you can click the participate link at the top, and you'll see the Slack channel. You'll see the Google group. Uh, the GitHub repo, um, the, the, the folks in OpenMB, for example, who are developers tend mostly to communicate on GitHub. <laughs> They're not, <laughs> not chatty folks. You can ping them on the Slack channel, but as Tim has seen, sometimes it takes some, uh, nudging to get them to respond. Um, yeah. and, uh, the Google group, of course, and then we have, uh, a community presentation meeting every every month, a couple times a month, and the leadership meeting. So, and it's entirely open. Anybody can participate in the leadership meeting or the community meeting, uh, provided mm -hmm. that ever, there's a consensus that the topics they're bringing up are are part of our scope and charter. So, mm -hmm. and so no, yeah, please. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, there's no formal organization behind OpenMB. No? There's no the OpenMB Limited. Or so it's it's just a group of people, mainly staffed by by people from NASA, JPL. Then, is that correct? It is the the community itself is is I would say at the moment there are folks from Ford, Boeing, mm -hmm. Lockheed. Um, 
I believe there's still some folks showing up from Raytheon, uh, from the academic side. There's folks from Georgia Tech and Stevens, uh, and of course, JPL. And we have had other NASA folks show up outside JPL too, occasionally. Mm -hmm. um, the, the software portion, the, the asset portion of OpenMB is sponsored by NumFocus, which is an open source software foundation similar to Apache or Eclipse or something like that. Um, and the main service they provide is uh, indemnification. So uh, mm -hmm. they are there to help open source projects protect their assets. Because one of the reasons we chose the Apache 2 license is because there are cases where other open source licenses or even no open source license published with the code uh, has allowed folks to patent it and then sue the creators for possessing it. So. Mm -hmm. um, at least that's what I was told. <laughs> I don't have a specific <laughs> example for that. That's that's that was one of the uh, uh, highlights that we got from folks in Apache about why the Apache Two license is good. So, but NumFocus protects you know the OpenMB name, trademark, uh, copyright, all that kind of stuff. So that mm -hmm. uh, um, we have that. That so um, yeah. But the community at large is is. Um, is kind of the community at large so um mm -hmm. it's intended to be open we do publish a uh, uh a code of conduct i think we use the inner source com the open source commons i think it's called source conduct so um mm -hmm. but it's a yeah open source communities are largely self-governing uh funding is you know <laughs> there's no no if you ask there's no owner of OpenMB. No, the owner of the Open no. of OpenMB is, is the community. That's correct, and it's, oh. and, and it's licensed yeah. as such. So, um, right. yeah, any any anybody can fork it, own it, mm -hmm. use it, and you know, it's in some ways it's like a new way of standardizing things, right? So, mm -hmm. um, but code is a little more complex than documents, so. <laughs> mm -hmm. And uh, if I'm a vendor and I would like to contribute uh, an integration to my tool, um, is this is this possible in an easy way? And is it still my code? How does that work? Sure. No, that's a really good question. I mean, if a if a vendor wanted to integrate with OpenMB, there's no requirement that they contribute any of that code. Um, they they would they could build a completely commercial integration um and yeah and if they if that's how they choose to do it that's how they choose to do it they could open source uh an in the integration as well um and maintain mm -hmm. it through open um mm -hmm. yeah i think that's that's a pretty open uh situation how, how Dassault has done it is they took portions of the OpenMB code, integrated it into their product, and then they sell that commercial product. Um, and I think that's fine. I, I call this kind of the technical morality case, right? I think the OpenMB community is concerned with the technical correctness of a model-based engineering environment and the code that supports it. Um, so in that respect, somebody who's offering that as a service is, I think, absolutely welcome to commercialize that and take advantage of that. Like so many organizations have with open source software, like IBM's recent acquisition of Red Hat, for example, mm -hmm. Linux kernel, still open source. So, and now you have to mm -hmm. pay. Well, I guess you always have to pay for Red Hat at some level, but yeah, it's a, it seems like it's getting a little tighter now. <laughs> no more CentOS, the same way it used to be, so. <laughs> Is there already a yeah. full service provider for OpenMB, a, a professional one, or do you think that there will be some service providers in the future where I can, as, as a company, just buy it, like I can buy Teamwork Cloud Server today? Um, I think I, I, don't, I haven't seen anybody that's offering that um, directly. Um, mm -hmm. I know of cases where vendors or contractors have made such arrangements with organizations um so but no there isn't like a, a a commercial enterprise as yet that has appeared 
mm -hmm. to provide OpenMV as a product, um, like you might like Red Hat or something like that. Um, but hey, I, th I think actually SysML two will will really push on that. So the mm -hmm. the key the key feet the key future features of the OpenMV software are really aiming towards a SysML two mm -hmm. world. Um, as well as kind of a unified graph world too. So if you look at the architecture description that's published for MMS5, um, it really paints a clear path for how the MMS will support the SysML2 service API, but also how it will be capable of providing uh, support for other model-based formats like uh, GraphQL or uh, OSLC or such like that. Um, mm -hmm. And, and provide, have the facilities behind the scenes to have a scalable unified graph uh, of information behind it. So um, I think I think that's where the future is is, is coming and it will it'll be a more and more of a heterogeneous enterprise. So I do know that Boeing certified their, their open, their uh, deployment of OpenMB to the DO-178 standard, so. It is qualifiable in that respect. Mm -hmm. And can you name some other projects or companies that already use OpenMV? So you mentioned Boeing, and I guess uh, NASA also uses <laughs> OpenMVE. Mm -hmm. But there are there other ones? Um, yeah, I think uh, I think I think Ford is going to do their pre do a presentation on it um, at the workshop. So that'll be something to see. I know Stevens mm -hmm. has done a lot with it in the research and educational community, as has uh, George Tech. Um, mm -hmm. And I think one of the videos on uh, YouTube actually shows a pre part of the presentation shows, so highlights some of the organizations that use it. And of course, as we were talking about earlier, uh, some parts of the OMG are starting to use it. Uh, the mm -hmm. SysML2 spec uh, team is actually using it to generate the SysML2 specification um, mm -hmm. using SysML1 and 2, I guess. Um, so it's a, uh, um, yeah, there are there mm -hmm. are others. Not everybody ha that I know about has explicitly authorized me to tell that story for them. So mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yes. uh, in some cases, they've explicitly asked me not to. Um, so mm -hmm. yeah. But the, the that that video has has the, the list. Uh, okay. Robert yeah. put it together in his methodical way. So, um, <laughs> yeah, I guess we will provide the link in uh, the description of the video here, and people can look it up. We also said, um, yeah, that we will. Uh, oh, we already have linked uh, the OpenMBE uh, YouTube channel uh, from our channel. You can switch over. Uh, a lot of interesting stuff there. Yeah, yeah, yeah you definitely. can get a demo without installing it. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah, it's good to yeah. see that, that the, I think what's also emerged as the most novel feature of view editor is this notion of transclusion. So the inventor of the hyperlink, whose name escapes me at the moment, also invented this this concept called transclusion, which is like a reverse hyperlink, uh, where you mm -hmm. dereference the content behind the link and display it in place. Um, so, in terms of software application novelty, the heart of View Editor is this ability to uh, transclude, or as we colloquially refer to it, cross-reference pieces of the model in the document to make it mm -hmm. communicatable. So. Um, and that that simple principle pervades all aspects of the software. So, mm -hmm. yeah, and you can also edit the model through the view editor, right? So some some elements. So Correct. Correct, nice, and that's uh... that's 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 part of that notion actually that because it's cross referenced, when you go to edit it, you're actually editing with the actual model element in the repository, not a, not a a wiki page that talks about it and lets it get out of sync and stuff like that. So when you mm -hmm. when you edit it in one view, those edits will show up 
in all your documents because it's using this transclusion feature to dereference the content from a central location. Mm -hmm. Cool. Pretty cool. So now I can store many different models in, in the MMS. There can be a Sysmail model, BPMN, uh, Modelica, or whatever. Everything can be in MMS. And are these models in MMS all mixed up or can, can jump from one model to, to another or are, are they still in, in silos in the MMS? So is Good this question. So a the, key to this interoperability issue? <laughs> right, right. No, the, so the organizational uh, schema, if you will, of MMS is similar to GitHub. So we have uh, an org and a project. And then within that mm -hmm. project, you can have multiple models. Uh, each of the models are, are version controlled. Mm -hmm. um, and the uh, and and you can branch and stuff like that. Um, in in uh, in in MMS four, it, it doesn't have the greatest merge capability, largely because um, in modeling, like the the notion of of diff and merge is a lot more sophisticated than it is in uh, um, software code. In, in software code, yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. And I think the I think actually the Libre Libre folks have uh, included MMS now in there. Oh, I should have thought of that on your earlier question. Yeah, I think they've included MMS now in their Lemon Tree product. Um, yes. That 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 so you can buy that additional capability there. But yeah, all the models will go in there. It's it's a uh, um, it's got a lot of the basic Git features around being able to branch. Mm -hmm. um, and it keeps version history and stuff like that. So um, yeah. that's the basic mm -hmm. organizational ski schema. The key difference between MMS4 and MMS5 is the semantics of the model in MMS4 would still need to be added if you wanted the service to understand them. So the service right now stores the model, but it doesn't really know about the meaning of the model. So right. like Magic Drop, for example, extracts it but we rely on the magic drop client to understand it. Um, so, and if you're working in like Python or something like that, then similarly you'd have that situation. In MMS5, however, with the introduction of the graph database, uh, you'll have those semantics stored in the graph mm -hmm. as part of what the model is. Um, so that's the, the key mm -hmm. distinction there. Yeah. And a very challenging technical uh, mm -hmm. activity. <laughs> yeah, sounds sounds promising. Uh, so I think we will keep up with this topic, and I guess this would not be the last episode about it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, Chris. Uh, then I would say thank you very much for all the information. Um, it was a pleasure uh, having you on the show. Um, Tim, what's our next topic? Uh, the next topic is model-based product line engineering, and our guest will be Marco Folingeri from Airbus. And it's scheduled for February the 7th, it's a Monday, and same time. Cool. Yeah, so... so... Go ahead. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I just wanted to remind uh, all our listeners uh, who did not subscribe to the YouTube channel yet to do so. Chris did uh, some some weeks ago, I saw. <laughs> and yeah, Great. so you don't miss any other episode. Okay, and so finally, our last words, do not forget. Trust us, we are systems engineers. <laughs> okay. <laughs> bye bye. <laughs> bye, Chris. Thanks.